Yeah, I don't. The problem is, I don't. Ever since I had kids, I don't think I've been able to keep going. Right? Like, <laughs> I just wa- I wake up at all random times of of the night, and then I'm up, and sometimes I just can't go back to sleep. You know, so. I got to that point where I was like the other night where I was like, all right, I'm not going to sit here and lay here anymore. Like uh, I might as well go do something and then see if I can get tired. So I went out to the garage and I was welding up that shroud. But like, again, like, you know, we have, we have this, you know, this, obviously uh, we use this 3d scanner that, uh, when we're scanning, uh, brake data. Mm -hmm. So we'll scan, uh, the car's brakes. Um, and then we put that 3d, uh, image into the computer, we're able to make 2D drawings um, from the brake caliper, the rotor, and have all the different nuances, which is pretty interesting. It's a, it's a, it's kind of a newer thing for us in the past few years to be able to utilize that technology because it's so affordable, right? Well, I mean, here's the thing too: it's also obtainable. That's the yeah. biggest. Thing, oh yeah, right? yeah. I mean, if let's rewind the clock a couple of years, and you know, 3D scanning is nothing new. It's been around for quite some time. 100%. But yep. even if we went back, rewound the clock five years and what one of those scanners would go for, or, you know, it's like, we can't afford to buy something like that. We need no. to hire someone to do it nope. with an exorbitant hourly rate. Yep. And now we're in a position where you could buy one off Amazon or any sort of the retailers for, what, under 400 bucks, something like that? Yeah, and I mean... We, and- and there's definitely there's definitely like a flow like I mean oh man he's show, I'm, I'm looking at the B roll like Rob Parsons the one he uses but that's a big dollar one yeah yeah he's got there are there are some pretty rad ones out there like you can get really finite in the details yep and so they have some really expensive ones but then there's you know ones that you can get that are really decent for under a thousand bucks I mean we're talking about you know um, accuracy within plus or minus. 0.1 millimeters like that's that's crazy right so unless you're doing some aerospace stuff like i don't really know that that would make much of a difference and the technology obviously is getting better and better as we go so like yeah i mean for like you said there's been ferro arms and all these different things that have allowed us to do 3d scanning but the cost was so high and so prohibitive that unless you were a production company that really needed that to and you, the roi was going to constantly be there right Yep. Weather tech floor mats, different things like that. You know that they're using that stuff. Right. You know, Rob obviously with you know with cagekits.com. Um, shout out to the homie uh with yeah. the plug. But but um nice. You know, I mean, like what they do is they, they're able to 3D scan everything and then yep. they're able to manipulate and tweak and make little adjustments or whatever they have to do within, you know, within um, you know, some sort of 3D CAD program. Mm-hmm. And then they send that information on to their benders and they get precise bends and angles. And they even have, um, I don't know if Rob has it, but I'm pretty sure he does, like different cutting uh, things. So they'll actually grab the bar and they'll actually have a laser that will come through and they'll actually cut the bet, like the actual um, notches so that you can have the tubes fit in really nice. And uh, I know that some of these companies, when they do high production, they'll even label them like it would be 1A. So when somebody gets this kit, and they go to weld it into their car. Um, it's just as simple as like kind of doing a a, a Lego well, kit, but they still have to square everything up and make sure it's installed properly. I think I knew where you're going with this, right? So you know, the rad thing about all these new scanners and all this tech, especially for cage builders, where you can do very finite bends to match internal body contours or even yep. external body contours. Yep. You know, a few years ago when I was getting my car back on the road, I bought a a bolt-in, like, full cage. I forget who the manufacturer was, and I threw it in there, and I was just like, there's no way I'm going to be able to drive with this car. Yeah. Even yeah. as it is, like, my seat is basically on the floor, and with a helmet on, I'll occasionally, like, smack the roof of the car. Yeah. And, and adding sort of a – it wasn't it wasn't a generic cage. It was a cage built for the 911. Right, but it was right. such a, a broad swatch attempt that it just it wouldn't work. And yeah, that's yeah. the beauty of bringing the scan, the scanning, and even into like some of the three D printing stuff into our space, where we can get very precise in the bends, in in the cuts of the cages, and to match contours of cars in ways we wouldn't be able to do before. And rather than gaining, say, like a couple of millimeters, we could be gaining a couple of inches. Yeah, it goes yeah. a long ways. 
Well, and I think it's interesting too, especially like, well, I mean, and, and uh, not that this whole thing revolves around ca uh, cages, right? Yeah. But like, you know, when you start to think about the fact that like, if I think about drag racing, right? Like the big thing for us was always about when we were doing a cage in one of the cars, we always had to make sure that we, before we ever went there, we had the seat mounted, we had to have all the belts mounted. Like we needed to know where the heights were going to be and all the positions were on everything. So you got all your controls, your seating, everything was set up. And it's because, you know, especially within drag racing, the idea is that like one of the rules that used to be there was that, um, that your door bar had a pass between your elbow and your shoulder. Right. So even for met for, for precise accuracy of when they're putting this stuff in, but now you think about this, right. It's not, a, it's no longer a, that type of um, measurement, like they are able to take the seat data, take take this data, take that data, get everything affixed within a position, and and kind of be able to say, all right, we know where that's going to pass. We can design the cage, you know, using some of that information. So super interesting, especially as you start to see this thing kind of go on and on, and technology just keeps getting better. You know, you know, I don't, yeah, I, I don't use a, I don't use a three D scanner. I don't, I've never used one. I don't do any three D printing or anything like that. I would love to. I would love to get into it. But uh, so like the three D scanner that you have there, like, does that do you any good if you don't have access to a three D printer, or does, yeah. or does being able to take the the scan and put it up into a, a CAD or something give you enough information for what you might be doing? Yeah, like you know, for us. Yeah. We like we we do have a 3D printer, mm -hmm. um, so that we can try to print out and just kind of visualize, um, you know, what the yeah. wheels look like in person rather than just the 3D drawing. So there is that. But you know, I think what's interesting is like uh, like these, you know, the 3D scanners. Which you know, look, if you go back a few years ago, um, <clears throat> you know, we were using profile gauges and being able to kind of just do measurements with micrometers. We had a very complex way of you know, different measurements that we would take. And then once we took those measurements, uh, we would be able to translate those over to a three to a 2D drawing. And then that drawing is what we what we draw and we keep that caliper file in our cal caliper library to check things when we're making wheels and trying right. to consider the different tech, right? Like that we're trying to make the spoke clear around and stuff like that. And that's how we improve the accuracy of the fitments for wheels, right? right? Mm -hmm. Like that's how we make sure that we know what cars we're, we're going to fit or not. But, you know, now comes the scanner where, you know, we can get a much more precise and accurate picture of that brake data. And that brake data is put into a file and, um, and we have the 3D so we can now look at a total environment, right? right? So we can see where the fender is. We can see where the fender liner is. We can see where the suspension lines up. We can see all that stuff in a corner. And save that file, and then from there we also create a 2D, which is a flat file that we'll do, use to put into wheel drawings. Yeah. Um, but the incredible part about it is the tech that you now can get with these things is super affordable. Yeah. You know, you can get something like this. You know, for I mean, well under under 800 bucks, it's it's great quality. Some people are able to get you know ones that are well under 400 bucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, it's 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 absolutely mind-boggling yeah. right I've, I've seen some of those in the like the 3d printing space um there's a brand i think it's called creality you mm -hmm. know they've got a little you know basically a little tabletop scanner sits on a little tripod i think it sells for like three or four hundred bucks and you know following sort of the 3d printing space it seems to be fairly popular just from a reproduction uh perspective yeah oh uh, yeah people try i mean dare I say knockoff parts or something like that, or even create their own and making some adjustments to it. Right. You know, and we've seen this a couple of times, um, you know, various social posts and stuff like that, where folks are scanning um, their AC vents in their cars. Yeah. Right. And you know, we were talking earlier about, you know, old cars and availability of parts and, yep. you know, here's a great opportunity where, you know, sure. We might've had to pay, you know, super exorbitant money, for you know rare parts if we can find one that's like somewhat broken and scan it and fix it in cad and then print it yeah there's a myriad of printing opportunities i mean sort of a bit of a rejuvenation to the old car market right yeah. finding yeah. parts that aren't even available anymore and bringing them back to life or yeah. modifying them. well and i think like and that's the interesting part i think that we're starting to get into um, a point 
for those that are maybe complex, more advanced, or maybe more complex automotive enthusiasts. And and the reason I'm mm-hmm. I'm not I'm not derogatorily saying that. I'm saying it for a reason, right? Like for example, I I would imagine that I'm a little bit more on the upper end scale yeah. of the car people as far as the amount of work I do on cars, mm-hmm. right? I'm not saying that for everybody, but I'm saying if you were to list all the enthusiasts out, like I, I have to rank maybe in the top third or something mm-hmm. as far as like how many people are willing to go work on cars. I think that's fair. I would consider myself in the probably lower third. Okay. You know? So, and, and there's going to be people across the, the gauntlet, right? But what mm-hmm. I mean is like yeah. if, you know, like I have a fairly large amount of tools, right? I have multiple large toolboxes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, say I, that I, with pride, say yeah. that with pride. No, I, I do. I do. <laughs> but what I mean is, but, uh, but I'm also, I also recognize the fact that like, I'm more like, if I ever come across a process that requires me to have a tool and it's remotely affordable for me, I'm going to go buy it. Yep. I'm not going to borrow it. I may have friends that have it. I'm not going to borrow it. That's not the point. I want to have the tool in the toolbox so that when I come across this again, I'm covered. So I'll spend the money. Um, <laughs> And, and I, you know, the same thing with welders and plasma cutters and, you know, I have magnetic drills and like whatever, you know, and, and, and so I think you get to a point, like the same with thing with la- like a m- small lathes and stuff like that. Like I don't have a small lathe. My friend has one. And if I had any more inches in my garage to spare, yeah. I promise you I'd have a lathe or a CNC. Like I would mean, absolutely have that. Meanwhile, stuff. I was picking up used tires from junkyards, you know, so <laughs> w- w- we're very different, Scott. <laughs> But so I get, all right. So let me circle back around to where I was going with this. Um, I guess the point is, I think for maybe somebody that's in that upper third, as far as the amount of work they want to do on cars yeah. or what they're willing to fabricate, I think that the 3D scanners and 3D printers are coming into a really amazing point where you're going to start to see these be additional tools. Ooh that will be added into everybody's quote unquote toolbox. Yeah. For example, I even think about some of my old school car friends and when I show them like I'll I'll be like, "Oh, they're like, "Oh, we got to get this contour right." And I'm like, "Listen, man, like if if you're going to end up doing that in fiberglass, like we can make the plug for it. You know, we scan it and then it you 3D print this thing out and then you basically have something to uh, lay carbon fiber over or whatever it is. And it's not, it's exact. Isn't this similar to what, uh, Forsberg did with his build? That's sick by the way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He 3d printed that, um, wide he, body kit. Yeah. For the, what is it? Ultima? Yeah. No, it wasn't. Ultima. I don't remember what, what it was it? for, but oh. yeah. Well, so I, I think it's a new, I think it was a new Ultima or something. Right. Okay. So, um, I don't think it was that, um, but yeah, like, so, so, so this is it. I think this is super interesting. Like, I mean, first so it's, off, it's just molds, right? I don't well, know that. I don't, I don't know if he, if they ended up body working that I would imagine, but like, hmm. think about how much money some of this stuff costs when you like, if you're especially going to go drifting and stuff, um, pretty and we're starting right? to see some of it into the manufacturing space as well too. You know, some of the hiring Gucci, you know, custom cars, stuff like that. Um, there was like, I think Koenig's Egg does like 3D printed exhaust and there's the 3D printed car that's out there. Um, yeah. But yeah. for the for the home garage, though, you know, dare I even say like, will 3D printers be like having a microwave in your kitchen? Now, granted, I don't have a microwave, but I do have a 3D printer. You don't have a microwave? <laughs> No, oh, please don't get me started with this. Oh, man. We had this conversation yesterday. He yeah. said he's never you a, microwave. a microwave. What do you? What no, do you let's mean? Not, I don't think we have time to go down that road. He's let me I'm give just... you the punchline. He thinks it sucks the flavor out of the food. But, it does. Uh, John, <laughs> you, have, you have kids. Are you depriving them from Hot Pockets or what's going on? I mean, no, I, no, I don't. I make nicer food than that. Okay, fair enough. Nice. Fair enough. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have time for nicer food. Hey, I'm just yeah. saying. I yeah. mean, I, I, that was a pretty easy thing for me when I was a kid. I understand. But, but, like, <laughs> but, I, but I, you know, actually, crazy thing is one of the reasons why I got a 3D printer yeah. uh, was to make toys for the kids. Okay. That's like, cool. Okay. So, like, little, like, for example, like I've played around different filaments. Um, there's um, flexible filaments. There's yep. now there's filaments filled with wood. 
uh, fill with carbon fiber, yep. so like you know, from parts perspective, stuff like that. Um, and so there's a lot of files actually that you print. Like there was this octopus that I printed, made it out of a flexible filament, and you, when you pry it off the board, it all the tentacles move, the whole nine yards, floats in the water. Cool. And they loved it. And I'm like, cool. That that five dollars that it cost me to print that, and they get a gas out of it for. I mean, kids have a nuclear half life of toys, right? <laughs> you know. It, that that definitely played into it. Well, I think um, I think what's fun is like, um, oh, that's pretty dope. What I think what's fun is like, um, like our, our our mechanical engineer Raphael, right? Yep. Like so, he he'll he'll scan entire pieces of his car and make little doodads, and like he he scans something. He made a whole new like custom air box with like a different like intake feed or something like that. Um, and he, you know, he starts out by basically scanning it, getting dimension, goes into AutoCAD. Obviously, he's way more, um, bit more advanced, advanced than I am. I mean, I'm like, oh, okay, scan the file. Here you go. <laughs> um, but but what's cool is I think that when you start to think about the garage, right? Yeah. Like, and I think about it, you know, even like the, a good example would be some of the Skyline people, right? R32, 33, 34s, to get interior parts is criminal right and largely because a lot of the r32 and 33 some of these interior parts they just don't don't make them anymore right you can't get them right so like what do you do if you break a window switch what do you do if you break you know a, a, con a center console what do you do if you break you know like like john said before your your air vents oh it's right? easy Easy. Like, you drive around with it broken. No, that's the <laughs> no. point. The point <laughs> is, the point is, you know, now with especially with open source and how many people that are scanning things and do it, like you get you get these files and all of a sudden you're able to actually reproduce it with a three D three D printer. Yeah. So well, it, it, like in the Overland space, like for example, like when I go out wheeling, I carry a Garmin inReach. And, you know, times where I won't have, you know, access to a phone. Um, I do not have a Wii Boost. I'm not that person. I don't know what but, an inReach is. What is it? So it, it's a it's a GPS device made by Garmin. Okay. And it's basically, uh, you can use it for tracking. You can use it for texting. Uh, it's for simple communications. Uh, I, you know, I can't make a phone call from it, but I can definitely send a text message or oh, so send my track to someone so they could follow where I'm going. So you, have a, chicken, you, have, a, you have send a, help. Uh, it's a <laughs> modern day pager. Yeah, ex exactly right. <laughs> it's pager the, yeah. GPS. It's the it's it's like the original two A. Like you know, the, yeah, remember, yeah. You remember the Sidekick? <laughs> it's the and, and so in, in this this group I wheeled with for a while, one of the guys uh, who was an engineer designed a clip. That mm -hmm. um, clipped into the back of the inReach so that I could mount it onto my dash. Cool. And shared that file along. It's like, hey, if you've got a printer, here's the STL file, have at it and print it. Yeah. And so it's like, how much of that is happening, you know, in just about every aspect of automotive where there's like all these little tinkered projects up and right for various cars? I mean, it kind of makes you wonder would the OEMs ever get involved in this side of things or, oh, you know, basically just selling STL files, you know. To, to print the items ourselves, I, yeah, it looks might like, get a little risky. But. If I've seen this dude, by the way, if you're if you're listening on iTunes right now, I'm talking about the B roll that Max is rolling over, um, over on your YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah. But but what's interesting is like this dude is straight up awesome. He he builds these little like you know uh, Arduino boards and Raspberry Pi stuff, and then basically uh, he's making these new gauge configurations to go into the stock yeah. locations and vents and stuff like that. Um, I think it's super cool. It's just at that point when we, when we start talking about, if you're the type of person that's going to be into buying fabrication tools, right? Mm -hmm. You got welders and you have, you know, benders and cutters and metal shaping things. If you have, um, lathes, if you, if you're that person that like makes stuff, then you just have to think that with a, with the affordable price, I mean, most of that stuff is going to cost way more than, 3D scanners and 3D printers, yeah, you yeah. have to think that at the end of the day, we're not too far behind a lot of these just car people that are not techie people. Yep. Yep. Adopting having these things in their garage. Yeah. Not because they're a novelty, but because they almost are another tool <laughs> within fabrication. 
Absolutely. Oh, I have I mean, like I have like three. I'm sorry, John, I cut you off. Yeah, I, have, yeah, I, have, yeah. I have like I have like three or four points to say on all this. So going back to what John originally said about having OEs in yep. on this, if I was a person who was looking to buy a car and you knew that there was gonna be kind of limited uh limited numbers of this car, whatever it may be, and you knew that you're gonna lose after you know support from the OE at a certain point, mm-hmm. like the, they already said that they're gonna stop production of the of the R35 GTR because they're gonna there's gonna be a lot of parts that you can't get. But if those OEs said, "Hey, we know that we're not gonna offer the parts from, but we go offer 3D files." So for you guys out there who have these cars, if you have the capability, you guys can take these files and do what you may with them to to produce quote unquote aftermarket you know you know uh, you know OE parts for your car. I think that would be a huge incentive for me to want to uh, uh, you know get involved with that or whatever it may be. And then second to my point. Um, with you saying that, is this something that people are going to automatically want to add into their toolbox? Um, you know, I think that there's a big pro to it because uh, if you could use this for for not just stuff for your car, but you could use it for other things like making toys for your kids or tech stuff or whatever it may be, all of a sudden it becomes a very vers- uh, you know versatile tool. You know, that's what that's what I think I mean, at least. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this is what I like. I'll I'll take this with me on trips or something like that. Leave it at my desk. This was 3D printed. It was actually printed flat like this and then when i need to put on my desk put my phone on oh, that's cool there we go yeah doubt has a really cool one too a little phone holder on his desk as well 3d printed but yeah. and that was a i think a 45 minute print that's pretty you know, cool something, something easy it just i i think the point is i i would expect to see some sort of scanning and 3d printing become a bit of commonplace in the you know shady tree mechanics garage yeah you know as far as just you know, rekindling old parts, you know, modifications of, of current ones, you know, or just, you know, putting different devices in the car and needing mounts for it. Yeah. You know, it, it will take a bit of a an extra thought process because, you know, it, when you start getting CAD software and kind of getting your mind in that space and, you know, it could be a little laborious, you know, trying to design just how they move, you know, how things move in that software versus you know getting out a pipe cutter and some welding and going down that road it's a different I, skill set but yeah. it will it'll come together i was gonna say i guess but like how many years did it teach did it take me to really get to a point where my tig welding was even halfway decent right how many like, years what how many years I still mean, working on it. i well yeah i mean always but like i think i think because you know i don't do it every day right but like i think the nature of you know, take welding. I think it took me about a solid, you know, projects and, and, and messing around for about a year before I got to a point where I was like, <clears throat> the welds look decent enough. And I was really having really continuous and, um, um, consistent, um, penetration. Cause that's okay. really the, like the thing you can make a weld that looks good, but It just doesn't, it's not like, it's not structural. Right. And so the only way you really know that is just, well, it depends. Like, you know, if you're welding pipe, like aluminum pipe, a lot of times you'll see that kind of that weld mark on the inside of the pipe, but there's a lot of different things. And I think that, um, you know, getting to a point where everything is good. I mean, it takes time, right? Mm -hmm. You know, people that just, people don't just jump on these things and like immediately they're amazing. They may get things that look more presentable or others, but you know, when you start getting into more complex shapes or maneuvers or angles or whatever, that's where a lot of that experience starts to come in. But so this might be a bit controversial. Um, but with all the you know different tools in, you know in the toolbox in the garage, adding you know a scanner, printer, CAD software into it, are we at all getting to the point where sort of a dilution of our skills? and being able to master certain processes like Mm -hmm. where we 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 know a lot of little things but not very in depth just because there's so much that one could do now well look i mean i would argue that if you want to take that point and i'm not saying i do but if you could if you're if you want to take that point i would argue that that's been happening and since since the aftermarket started to release bolt on anything Right. Like, I mean, I think about when I first really got into cars, you know, and especially import cars where, you know, uh, that whole sport compact movement was really just in its infancy in in a lot of respects. Everything we got for our cars, for the most part, 
we had to make. Now there were some things that were off the on the shelf, just becoming on the shelf, right? There was an increase in the automotive aftermarket that was starting to put things out there, but there was a lot of things that weren't available, and we we were we were comfortable with you had to make that. Now, some people were good at making stuff, and other people were not. Yeah. Right? Some people made cars that looked really good, and other people cars, you know, looked pieced together, just okay. But <laughs> once they got to a point where everything was bolt on, I would argue that my brother, who's about four years younger than me, his friends that were into cars. They were very different car people. In other words, even four years difference, because they had so much more aftermarket support, they they were very, like, if you gave them a kit with everything in there, they had the mechanical knowledge to bolt everything on, get it working, et cetera. Yep. If they had to diagnose anything, if they had a kit that maybe didn't have all the parts, if there was, a, like, a little bit of fabrication involved, they really started to struggle and I know because that would be the point where they would come to me like, hey, like, do you think you'd help me with this? I'm just trying to put this thing in. I'm stuck here. The, the tinkering aspect of it. Yeah. Well, is, is it really tinkering? The tinkering aspect It's more of the, it's say, more the of problem solving part of it. Right. It's, it's the part of I know what to I'm, I know what to do because somebody told me versus I know what to do because I know how it works. Right. Yeah. Right. Like, I think if I had to separate the two, that's where it is. But, you know, I don't know. I mean, like like anything else. Right. You have an industry that starts. Um, I'm trying to think of a really good one. Like, I would argue that there's probably a lot less um, phone technicians that are out there doing hard lines to people's homes nowadays. Right. But like. Yeah. I mean, those, those people they kind of come back and now they're maybe doing digital cable and running fiber optics. Yeah. Here, here's the coax line in the house versus here's whatever the multi-wire was for, for hard phone lines. Right. It's a similar process, different technique. Right. And so you're always going to have people like as technology changes, right? Like I'm sure there was a lot of people that were pissed off in radio when the TV came out, they're probably like that TV thing's never going to catch on. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it's kind of like that. Like, I just think that the skill sets are shifting. Um, I will tell you that, you know, for me, I, I always feel a little bit more tied to the craft um, of building and fabrication. And I think a lot of it has to do with what I was in awe with when maybe when I was younger, I remember really intricate car builders and, and people that like were really more, way more knowledgeable than I'll, I'll probably ever be. And watching them like literally, you know, fix panel gaps by just TIG welding up doors and smoothing everything and look perfect and making these complex pieces that look like they were made by a robot and watching them do it. And I think After my hand. Yeah, like and I and I and I just think for me, like I have a lot of that um desire to have those manual skills, but mm -hmm. Man, I'll tell you, you know, like when we look back at this, you know, we may certainly be saying like, man, I wish I had the skill set to be able just to do some of these more complex operations with scanners and CAD programs. And so I, I just think it's a shift. I, I think you, it, you bring up a good point, though, too. So, sorry, Rich. Go ahead. go ahead. No, you go ahead. You bring up a good point because like when you think about the the manual aspect of the fabrication back in the day, mm -hmm. it was... Okay, well, once I have this, like, it, it, we're kind of done with it, right? Where in the case of using scanners and 3D printers, essentially we could put prototypes together way quicker yep. and make very subtle adjustments that maybe we wouldn't have been able to make before mm -hmm. because of the processes involved to make those pieces. And then now, because we can prototype stuff so much quicker, you know, moving that into a production sense it, is even that much more efficient. If it went into a production. Test. Right. I was just thinking like, those are a lot of words, bro, for tuning your car. Sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyhow, uh, uh, what were you going to say, Rich? It was not in line with what John just said, but if you guys want me to say it, I was yes, going to <laughs> say that. I think it's funny how I, when you say how it's starting to shift, um, I think it's funny that in in car culture now, I think you're going to start seeing a lot of integration, which I've already brought up this point a couple times where I feel like that the, the whole sim racing stuff has created this bridge between 
like tech people and computer guys and car guys. And I think it's kind of bridges thing. All of a sudden you have, you have these car guys that are familiar with uh, discord and uh, private servers and stuff like that. And then just, you know, computer settings, which is, you know, it might sound like, Oh, that's a really easy thing to do, but not everyone does that stuff. Yeah, exactly. You so, had to help me through it. Right. And I'm very tech savvy in terms <clears throat> of computer hardware and some software, but, um, and I feel like you're going to see a similar bridge here where you're going to start seeing car people who all of a sudden are pseudo engineers because they're doing stuff with 3D files and CAD and, and they're doing the stuff themselves. And I think it's just uh, it's kind of spreading the skill set along different um, you know fields. But the one thing I will say mm -hmm. is this is kind of to me on, on that premise we're we're getting back into that same thing I was saying before where. They'll know how to do something because somebody told them, but they won't know how to do something because they know how it works. And what I mean yeah. by that is like, <clears throat> for example, like you may know, go like, you know, this is how I want to make my 3D duct and I have the skills to go make this 3D duct. Right. But like, do you really understand fluid dynamics enough to design a duct that's actually functioning properly? Like, I know I don't. I don't understand anything you just said. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, we're not at a good start. Well, look, I mean... But but I guess the point I'm trying to say is like when we when we talk about airflow or, or different things like that yeah you know there is a pathway where things work and heat extracts and and that's for the people that really know that's what I guess I was going back to your point about the engineer thing right yeah. like are we making pseudo engineers well I think it's premise to understand there's a difference between being an engineer because you understand the science and the complexity behind how things work and being an engineer because you know how to operate the machinery and the tools. Right. Right. Well, like and, and even having an elementary understanding of things. And maybe that's a, a great starting point is, you know, when having access to this, it opens a door for, you know, sort of an evolution of ele elementary understanding of what one might think of this. Yeah. You know, in, in the engineering side of it and, you know, crawl, crawl walk, run analogy insert here. You know, it is a bit of a gateway into more understandings because of the uh, how how available it is. Right. Well, here's my rebuttal to what Scott just said. So um, I'm going to rebuttal back in terms of the tech sense. Okay. So um, if you're, you know, if, if people learn how to do this stuff, but they don't really, they just know how to do it because they were told to, but they don't have a full understanding of like maybe extra stuff or everything that goes into it. Like yeah. if I were to talk to you about setting someone else up with a sim rig, you yourself, yep. for you as an example, may you probably could get someone set up with a sim rig and get them the right settings or whatever it may be maybe you don't understand the difference between nvidia g-sync and v-sync or the limitations of a hdmi cable versus a, a, a display port cable yep. whatever it may be but if all the person wants to do is get get up and running the way you have yours up and running you could probably get them there I understand what you're saying. You're you saying I mean? that the result, the desired result may still be able to get there, even if they don't really understand how exactly they got. There. And they may not care. They, they, I think that's fair. Yeah. I think that's completely that fair. <clears throat> yeah. So, I mean, in that sense, like that's the way I've kind of been as a car guy, because a lot of stuff I've done has, has been all more or less bolt on stuff. And, you know, but I'm, I'm from a later generation from Scott and yourself, John. Um, and I've, you know, I've been able to help people out or whatever it may be with just yeah. the little bits of knowledge I know, but it's never to the extent that, that you guys might yeah. know. Yeah, but you know what? Look, I, I think that there's kind of a, a misstrewed thing here. Like, I don't, when I say any of this stuff, I don't I don't think that there's any less of a car person because you're not, let's say, super mechanically. But I, and I know you don't mean it that yeah. way. Like, yeah. I, 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 you know me, like, from a, from a wide perspective, like, I value anybody that has any love for automotive, regardless yep. of their you know, kind of in-depth knowledge or not, right? Yeah. I think that the, the issue that 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 is there, and 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 I I hate to go back to this because I, you know, you well, know I, where I'm going. Go for it. Kind go of, kind it. of. I don't know. You know, I, like I all I can think about is that stupid TikTok reel where where we took it out and people were just saying. There was a clip of me talking, and it was like a thousand. Remember, it's like oh, a thousand words for saying just tune your car, bro. Right. And all I can think about is I cannot believe so many people don't get the point. Yeah, yeah. You put in a big cam, or you put too much cam into a car. Mm -hmm. Does not matter. That's mechanically tuning. You cannot tune your way out of it. Right. You might be able to make it a little bit better. Might be able to take away some of the bad effects of it. But let me tell you something. If you have a car yep. and you put a turbo, 
the size of Jupiter <laughs> on it, it will not spool up anywhere in the RPM range that you possibly could use your car. Oh, Max pulled up the reel. <laughs> wow. I just, I just, I'm just, listen, I, I think- Maybe people, with a compound setup. <laughs> I, but what I'm trying to say to people is there is a difference between tuning your car yep. and mechanically putting parts that work together on a car. Absolutely. And that was that, I, and that was the context of that conversation. That was the context of that right. conversation. And every single one of those people yeah. went in there and said, Way to say tune your car, bro. Like I'm or telling just, you, just tune your car. Yeah, like you know. it's just yeah, like that's not what it is. Well, <laughs> it's not well, the same. You can't. There's different levels. There's yeah. this, like there's there's the mechanical aspect of it, and there's the you know the digital aspect of it, right? And like yep. you can only one either, each of them. You can only do so much of individually, right? And you know one can only compensate for one more. You know. I'm trying, I'm trying to think the best way to put this, but like from a compensation perspective, like you could do something, you know, mechanically and try to compensate for on digital, but you have a, a, a limit of what you can compensate for. Like yeah. and well, the pendulum swings both ways. But the computer, a computer mm -hmm. can only compensate so much, right? Like you, let's say you put in too, uh, too small of an injector. Mm-hmm. And you start running a lot of boost or you start making a lot more power. You can't just get in there and tune, bro, to make your injector bigger. <laughs> like you mechanically reach the limits yeah, yeah. of the injector. You need bigger injectors, right? Yeah. The same thing when you run past the duty cycle on a fuel pump. You get to that point, you might be able to mask it a little bit, maybe open up the injector a little bit more. But you're getting to that point where mechanically you're running past the limitations of what that part can do. So if you put that wrong part into your car, you can't just go to the computer and tune, bro. Yeah. Right? Now, now we got the clarification for that one. That was always the clarification. <laughs> just go back and watch the context of the podcast yeah. where people didn't do. They watched a 30-second you know, clip on TikTok and decided that I was talking about tuning when I was talking about actually mating your parts correctly yeah. so that you have a car that you can tune well and make good power. Good. We could put, we could, we could, <laughs> just tune it, just it, bro. We could, we could put that one to rest. <laughs> Thank goodness. You have a better latitude of adjustment when things are more in line with one another. Yeah. My God. Well, it's, it's just, and the part, and like, and this is the part that the, we always get clipped out on and people are like, boomer. It's not about boomer. It's about building cars, man. <laughs> like, it doesn't matter what you do. Like, you, you just can't, you just, you know. There's that. Well, you're not a boomer, so there's that. So we're good. Yeah, there. I don't think I'm a boomer. I mean, not yeah. yet. Anyhow, uh, yeah. But like boomers. going back to the 3D printing, I'm only yeah. because my Max just put up what I like to call uh, some of the most idealistic uses for some of this technology. Stefan Papadakis, who is a one, is a legend mm -hmm. in in our industry and. Um, and in this segment, um, he uses so much. And on his YouTube channel, he really provides a lot of context there, right? He he talks. He he uses you know um, um, he uses uh, SolidWorks. He uses 3D printers. He uses 3D scanners. He makes a lot of great parts. He makes a lot of great parts for race cars. And I think the coolest part about when you look at this is that you know he's like you had said, John, before. Like when you think about the idea that you would fabricate something, install it on a car, and then go, ah, that's not really exactly what we thought, you know. Yep. Go back to like if a Jason Whitfield, right? Who owns Whitfield Manufacturing, great company. Jason's been around for a million years, one of the fastest dudes back in the day. Million years. Um, with the Honda world, and he you know has a company where they build you know manifolds and and intakes and you know, a lot of hard parts and, you know, you would make a manifold and the only way you can decide if it was something that uh, really made a lot more power, spooled well, or whatever, was to basically make it, put it, a dyno, put it on a dyno and see if it gave you the result you needed. Right. Right. Including tuning the car. But, <laughs> but um, you know, now you can 3D scan and create these things you obviously have some stuff in solidworks additionally to that 
you know, you can check fitment by actually 3D printing <coughs> something and putting it. Is that like a 3D AMS printed does. part? That, yeah. No. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. They have Which metal 3D is? printing. It's uh, Max has some uh, uh, Stefan Papadakis stuff on, yeah. on the screen. But Absolutely. Th these parts look incredible. Well, but there, and, and, and I think it's a it's a it's that three D printing casting machine type thing. It that's why all that sand filament was there. Um, it like kind of does something when it's like electrically statically charging these particles into the shapes they want. Um, I'm sure that machine costs a billion dollars. Yeah. But yeah, cool. if, if I if I if I recall, I mean that's one where it's basically like a powder form, and then yeah. they're yep. using. Yep. The powder is melting together and then wiping another layer, yes, laying another yes, layer around. It. Yeah, it, it's similar to like the resin 3D printers. Yep. Okay. Where it's, okay. it's using, you know, a liquid in the similar process mm -hmm. um, and using UV to cure the resin in the shape that you want. It's like if you get a cavity filled to the dentist now. Is that what it is? Yeah. Huh. They use that. They use that same type of like acrylic. Like 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 he said, like resin and stuff like that, and then they harden it with no more porcelain like, fillings, huh? No, no. <laughs> In fact, people pay big money now to get all their aluminum and and other cr and porcelain and glass fillings taken out of their mouth and put in with the with the resin stuff. No more lead teeth. <laughs> Until we all find out later that resin's no good, I gotta have all my teeth taken out. Yeah, yeah. Look like Gumby. <laughs> well, here's a question for both of you guys that uh, I was thinking. So if you guys were looking to expand your toolbox at home and, yeah. and you wanted to. Always. I know you guys always, always. are. So, you know, if, if you were looking for that more affordable option of a 3D scanner, do you, th do you think that you feel more inclined to maybe purchase one because uh, it's not limited to just automotive and, and you can use it for your car and stuff you might want to do, but there's a little bit of a perk there because you can use it for other stuff as well? Or do you think that that's not really the case? Absolutely. And yeah. I and I would say no. So that's why I asked both. <laughs> so, so you wouldn't add you wouldn't add one to your your repertoire. No, no, no. That's not what I thought he was asking. I, I, I maybe I, I missed. I, I, well, no. I I was saying, would you would it be would you feel more inclined or easier to buy one if because you use it for other uses? You can use it for other uses as well. Or if you were going to buy one, would it just solely be for you know stuff on your car? All of the above. Okay, yeah. So you know, and, yeah, and you mean, and he uses it like that. So I think that's a yeah. good question. Um, so why would you not use it for other stuff? No, I didn't say I wouldn't use it for other stuff. But like, in other words, I wouldn't purchase one because I would be able to use it for other stuff. My purchase decision would be extremely based on the fact, do I have the competency and will I, will I be able to develop the knowledge to be able to use this in the garage as a tool? Mm -hmm. And if I could, I would buy it. Right. Right. If I felt like I was doing it to like make some other stuff, I just don't know if I have enough time and interest to want to do that. So I think that would prohibit to me. So I think it really just comes down to it. But like John said, he's he's made toys for our kids and he loves it. Like so, I think that that's yeah. there's totally yeah. understandable. And, and my limitation in it is having a better understanding of the CAD software itself. Yeah. Even though, like at one point when I was going to school for industrial technology, I was using CATIA and other programs like that. And you know, fast forward to a decade, you know, uh, I can't really move around CAD software that much right now. Like right. I have any <laughs> of it. Uh, but there's also, you know, like Tinkercad and things like that, like really simple free software. Um, but I would argue that, you know, the limiting factor of being able to fully utilize this technology is the the digital aspect of it, of designing it, you know, in, in the CAD software itself. Is CAD a free software? Not generally. There, there, there is free, <laughs> free CAD software out there, but it's AutoCAD. limited. AutoCAD's not free, I guess. So no, AutoCAD um, is very not free. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, SolidWorks again, very not free. Auto Fusion um, 360, you know, Fusion 360, very not free. Yeah, but I think there's a free version of Fusion 360. So I think there's a a student version. Yeah, but I I think that you still have to be a student to get it right. Uh, there's SketchUp, which is SketchUp. Owned, yep, owned by Google, I think, or they sold it or something like that. But yeah. There may be things, but they're not like, I'm not saying you can't, I don't know any of the nuances yeah. between what you can get away with and what you can't. Yeah. Um, 
I know that we use SolidWorks and another program when we develop wheels here. Yeah. I also know that we use AutoCAD a lot when we're doing, you know, fitment development and checks and stuff like that. Um, I can move myself around in AutoCAD pretty proficiently. Mm -hmm. um, I can draw some stuff in AutoCAD when it comes down to 2D uh, fixtures. When it comes down to SolidWorks, I could maneuver around. Can't really... I mean, I'd be there all day long trying to develop like something really complex. The the reason why I asked you guys that was only because if I, if I ever got, I have a strong interest in getting a 3d printer, uh, maybe not a scanner, but uh, yeah. a printer for say, um, because I think I would use it heavily for a lot of my tech setup or whatever. Like, like Wait, there, there are people who use it for like, like hard drive trays and stuff like that. And then mm -hmm. may, maybe, uh, stands for their controllers or headsets or stuff like that. Just be able to trick out your own little, you know, your little, uh, desk setup or yeah. whatever. And I'm into that, well, but yeah, I mean, and the important thing to understand there too, is that, you know, the strengths and weaknesses to each of the, the technologies that are out there, right? Yeah. Like a filament printer, you know, is great affordability and materials are inexpensive. But, you know, you'll have a bit more durability to it. But like a resin printer, for example, high resolution, low durability. And, mm. you know, when you start thinking about like when you add tools into your toolbox, you know, what what are the requirements? Like, you know, what is the intended purpose? You know, because you can, you know, if you really want to dumpster dive into it, I mean, you could have multiple printers for different purposes. And mm -hmm. like, yeah, you can get real ugly real fast yeah. well and and what's interesting is the learning curve that i was trying to figure out when, when i was researching to buy us our first 3d printer you know for out for out in california was like the whole idea of like all right well what do we need versus what's out there right. there's things with hot beds and different filaments and temperatures and enclosures to be able to keep things hot and keep things warm and you know some have to operate at different temperatures then you start to get into like all right i'm gonna i'm gonna make a part that i'm gonna use under the hood well, I have to have a 3D printer that's capable of maybe printing more of the nylon or the carbon fiber stuff because it's got higher temperature, whereas even the ABS is it's higher temp. It's not like you can run continuously at higher temp, so you wouldn't want to put it under the hood. Um, right, but also the case like ABS printing is fumes. Like that's... Okay. You, you got to think about... You know, think Exhaust about that. and stuff, yeah. The 3D yeah. printer has fumes? Well, no, well, it's a film itself. Oh. Yeah, so like... There's uh, like, you know, there's different filaments and ABS being a different type of filament for the printing process. Mm -hmm. um, ABS, very, very, very durable um, material. But from a 3D printing perspective, the fumes of it can can smoke you out pretty quick. Wow. Right. Same right. thing with resin printers. Like I wouldn't put a resin printer in my office. Let's put it that way. Like my eyes will probably start burning after a period of time. Wow. Not a good thing. I didn't, I didn't know that. That's crazy. So, what's that? I said that's crazy. Yeah. So it's. Again, going back to understanding, you know, uh, use case of the technology, where it's going to live is another thing to take it, you know, in the garage, in an office, whatever it might be. But, yeah. you know, especially in the case of like heat beds and boxes and stuff like that, but if you're going to be doing like a 20 hour long print or even further, like you have to keep the heat into that part so that yeah. it retains yeah. um, any sort of structural rigidity to it. Yeah. yeah. I, I always thought that, you know, I already said what I would, I think I would use 3d printing for, but in terms of automotive, I always thought the place it kind of fell into would be kind of that, uh, being able to, to re reproduce interior parts and stuff like that for things that you can't necessarily get parts for after a certain period of time. I feel like that's where it always had its nice little kind of place, but you start yeah. seeing people like the Chris Forsberg thing where well, like, that's crazy. So like, yeah, I mean, so awesome. not only obviously did he come with his own body kit, but like, think about this in the sense of like for the, for the home person, right? Let's say you want to have some sort of, I don't want to say this, like some sort of Nismo lip. Yeah. Right. Or something that is like a billion dollars, you know, something really expensive, mm -hmm. you know, or they don't have make any more or whatever it, it has is. to be imported, whatever maybe. And you can get your hands on one to be able to 3d scan this thing. And again, I'm not, I'm not, just to be clear, I'm talking about personal use and I'm talking about like, so I'm not talking about people going to rip off everybody's parts. Etsy store coming to live soon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. pretty much. <laughs> not, not what we're going for, but I'm just yeah. saying like the idea of being able to kind of maybe custom design some of these things or whatever it may be by scanning them, then bringing them in and kind of wrapping them in carbon fiber or using them as kind of to be able to overlay and set up and do different things. Like, you know, what, what, you know, are you are we at that point where you can kind of develop a lot of cool looking parts for your car 
if you're willing to put the work and time and, and obviously money, depending on what it is, into it. Um, again, I don't believe that you're going to, uh, you know, end up in a situation where, you know, you're going to find it really cost affordable or easy to just build your car out of, out of, you know, plastic parts. Like, right. You know, I mean, even if we go back to the 3D printing Lamborghini that we talked about, yeah, yeah. You know, he did that stuff when he printed everything in 3D. That was to get the original shape down, right? But like, then he went back and like put a different layer on all these different things to try to increase the structural rigidity, fiberglass, resins. There was there was more to it. It wasn't like, hey, let me go ahead and print this thing out, put it on a car, boom, made a fender. Done. Look at me, done. Right. Yeah, yeah. So it, you know, it's not it's not cheap. It's not. Uh, it's not the easiest way out, but like when you come into a limitation where something's not long, no longer made, if you have an idea of something you want to make, maybe custom, maybe something different, you want to do some other cool things. You could find yourself an easier solution. I think this is yeah. like, you know, without how, you know, and not to mention, let's go back to the 3d scanner for a second. John, they have all these great places now, like send, cut, send and all this stuff. Yep. You 3d these things in design something in CAD you send it to them, they manufacture it. Can I see, can I see that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> well, in, even from a 3D, uh, 3D printing side of things, um, there's plenty of 3D printing labs you can send things to. I think there was one called like Purple Platypus. Bottom, you know, crazy name for uh, a company, but like you can, That's the you can send uh, your files to to have it printed out because if there's you know, accessibility to a certain type of printer, like say yeah, printing yeah. metal or different type of filaments that your personal printer can't do, send it out. I mean, there's, you know, the sync cut send thing is a great opportunity, yeah. right? Yep. I mean, think of what it would, you know, if you rewind the clock again, you know, to have custom parts laser cut out and going through that whole process. I mean, you'd have to do pretty big bulk processes to have that done. And now you could essentially do one off. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, and and I think about like all the drama that we had to go through back in the day when we needed to make custom flanges or whatever it may be like, you know, it required you getting a piece of metal that was that thick, cutting it, right. you know, cutting it down, then taking it and you either had to, you know, scribe in the shape that you wanted and somehow sit there and try to chisel it out, grind it out, pour it out, or you had to take it to somebody that had uh, like a plasma cutter or a laser water cutter. I mean, it was a project, right? Versus okay. now, all right, let me scan this, this, or let me scan this whole thing. All right, I need a flange. It's got to be this shape, whatever. You send the darn thing out to a send cut send, maybe it costs you 60, 70 bucks, you know, to make this flange or whatever. But it's exactly what you need. So no you, guessing. You just send them the file. Yeah, you send them a file and wow. they, they basically come back and they can tell you, like when you put it up, you upload it, right? And it will tell you like, hey, here's the estimate for, here's the estimate to get it done. And, you know, this is how much it costs out of this material, this material, this material, this material, this material, this material. This is how much it costs to 3D print. This is how much it costs to, you know, um, be able to, if you want to add services like tapping or you want to add, you know, some like other things. They'll, they have all these things. You just kind of build your quote. Almost like when you go to like a, a printing company, and you try to order business cards or something. Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, do you want rounded edges? Do you want this thing? Just right. check the boxes. Now, um, but I think there's something that there's a lot to be said though about going to a fab shop, right? In the in having you design something yourself. Like you may have the expertise to lay something out uh, and what it needs to be cut to or you know shaped to, welded to, whatever it might be. But you know, there's a lot of there's probably a fair amount of folks out there that don't have that experience. And going to, you know, a fab shop or something like that, where they'll be like, yeah, we see what you're doing here, but you really should increase the tolerances by this amount more because the load that's coming through and what's going on, you know, is is a company like Send, Cut, Send, are they reviewing the files and providing that feedback or is it just kind of wild, wild west? Good luck. Well, it's exactly that. It is. I mean, I, I'm not saying I don't know them well enough. I don't do enough projects like that to know exactly if they ha offer a service to be able to do any FEA or any testing. But the truth of the matter is like that, that goes right back to my other point, which is that there's, that goes back to my other point, which is basically like, um, there's this level of, you know, can you do, can you 
do something to do it mm -hmm. versus knowing how to do it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, listen, there's pl I, I can't tell you how many times, and I'll still make these mistakes, right? Like, I think about the first time, like, I really got into, like, porting ahead, and then I took it somewhere that, you know, to, to a place that, like, the, you know, the, or these people that had a lot more knowledge than me, and they were like, oh, this is cool, but, like, you should have done this, or if you had radius this, or don't don't smooth this part out so much it will help it will decrease the way the fuel atomizes or you know like you know you want to you know do polish this part but not this part like that's all that's experience that's knowledge you can't you can do mechanical things you can be proficient in doing the tooling part it doesn't make what you did any more proficient or not that's where the skill and the the technical yeah. knowledge comes in you know right. well, well, yeah. so in terms of just generally speaking for like a send cause send, what, what's the limitations there? If you send them any file, they're capable of making. I'm sure they get back to you if they're not able to do it or not. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I think if it's producible, I mean, yeah. they do, like I said, I mean, look at this, this. They have laser cutting, water jet, bending, hardware, what about size? powder coating. What about, what if you're trying to build some, you know, make something really big? I mean, are they limited to that? I don't, I don't know what their, their size limitations are, but I will tell you that huh. like, I know, I know people that have developed parts, right? Um, and they've gotten them, like they've even, like I even know people that like in the more fabrication end that um, they've developed like one-off things and then they've send those files and everything over to like a send, cut, send or, or, or a build house. And then they basically get them made and they'll, they'll even come back with them after they're made. They go to powder coating. Like you can order a whole list of services come up with a finished product now as far as cost goes those services aren't necessarily cheap i wouldn't imagine so but when you finish your one-off piece if you don't have that equipment it looks like you know comes cnc that's milled it's done all the stuff oh well here's a question too this is just something that my thought goes to say say you did send off a file to someone you scanned it and you send off a file to someone and you get it back and it's exactly what you wanted right it came out perfect. Is it more valuable than for other people um, to have that file or to be able to 3D scan that finished? No, the file. The file is more, more important. Because you don't have to scan it. You're scanning it so you can get it into a file, right? So, like, if you have the file, you already have everything you need to manipulate it. Hmm. Okay. I don't know. So, are, are people just going to start monetizing files on everything? They, people or? do already. Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, there's, there's things that like, you know, people will say, Hey, look, you know, like here, you know, I can, I can give you the file, but it's, you know, this much money or you could buy this file or whatever it may be. And honestly, I think that, you know, they should charge the money for those files. There's a lot of people that put open source things. And I, I think open source is the fastest way for development and improvement, mm -hmm. right? If you have somebody that, that truly is going to put the time and effort into something and then somebody else can download it and go, wait, you know what? I just, I made this change on it, but it's because of this, 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 and this. And everyone's like, oh, that's rad. Dang so much. Your product's going to get better because there's always going to be somebody there that knows more than you do. Yeah. But for the guys that really have it figured it out and they want to just. You know where my head went to immediately from all that was like uh, on the first generation Scion TC, the first gen Scion TC, that car had an issue where uh, on on the lift gate for opening up the trunk, it's like the little plastic piece right on the trunk, yeah. and it's like the third it's brake. It's a Scion. Like it falling it. off. Yeah, it kept falling off. Everyone with the first gen Scion TC had that problem that those things used to fall off. Like it, it made me think, like you know, if you had someone who could just 3D print the better part for that, like that would be a uh, you could just monetize that, and every Scion owner would be knocking on your door. There's, there's yeah, so it, many there might be one out there. there. I mean, there probably is. I can't imagine. It's such an old car, but that's where my head went to immediately because I feel like that would be such a good solution for it because that's a, a really applicable example. There are a lot of parts out there right now where yeah. they've improved upon designs and everything like that. Yeah. Like, yeah, there was something I was looking at the other day. Oh, wait, that, Max just pulled it up. Yeah, but that was like the biggest common problem with that car. It was hilarious. Every, they all fell off. Every, yeah, exactly. The duct tape and stuff. So funny. But that uh, would. Yeah. That was something I found um, the other day with regards to like the fuse boxes on to, uh, Tacomas and Forerunners. Yep. I found a guy that made a essentially a lift for the top of the cover for the box. So there's you know more generous clearance inside the box if you're adding more, you know, adding more electrical into the box, things like that. And Toyota, you know, sort of made things a little too tight. Right, right. And I think that's sort of the beauty of all this is that, you know, we can continue to 
evolve our, our cars into what we want them to be. Yeah. That, that's and, sick use case right there. Yeah. So it's interesting. I mean, look, I, I think it would be, it's interesting. Like, like, you know, if you're, if you're listening to this podcast, you know, go over to our YouTube channel, throw some comments in down below. Um, and if you're on YouTube, throw, let us know, like, well, you know, do you, do you use the technology right now? Right. Yep. Do you, do you have these tools? Do they look more appealing to you as they get cheaper and cheaper? At what point do you, you know, want to use them? Do you get to a point where, you know, like, hey, that's not for me? Um, or do you envision this to be something that's much more widespread? You know, every home has a printer for their computer, right? John thinks that one day these will be more prevalent than the microwave he won't own. <laughs> so the question is, like, you know, are we going to get there? Is it going to be that everybody's going to have, you know, the printer for their paper and then the 3D printer for their items that need to be other than 2D? I don't yeah. know. Like, interesting thought. And, and drop, drop your comments below if you think John should get a microwave. <laughs> no, I'm not getting one. I, I, maybe, but they're convection me, now, me, John. Me and John will have a conversation. They, they about moisture that. the food by like recirculating <laughs> the aroma. Well, I did get an air fryer. I'll give yeah. you that. Okay, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. we're getting there. It's a step in the right direction. Yes. I guess. I mean, <laughs> you know, don't be afraid of small boxes that you put on your counter that, that contain nuclear devices to be able to put yeah, into your food. It's fine. I enjoy cooking too. Me too. Me too. Hey, but it's I a lot gotta easier tell when you, you go two zero zero. I, listen, I I like to cook too, but I but I gotta tell you, you know, like sometimes you just want to like nuke it. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Anyways, anyhow, uh, thanks for listening to us and hanging out. Uh, we do this every Wednesday, and we'll catch you on the next one. See ya.